Good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased to introduce our presenters. We have three members of the World Economic Forum Global Agenda Council on Aging here today. Our presenters are Dr. John Beard, Director of the Department of Aging and Life Course with the World Health Organization in Geneva. He works with the global community to meet the challenges and to maximize the benefits associated with the rapid aging of their populations. He is chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Aging and a member of the advisory board of the World Demographic and Aging Forum. John is an Australian physician and has held a range of senior public health and academic roles in Australia and the U.S. He has published widely in the international literature and remains actively involved in several large international research studies. Dr. Linda Freed is the Dean of the Mailman School of Public Health and the De La Mar Professor of Public Health. She is also Senior Vice President at Columbia University Medical Center, Professor of Epidemiology at the Mailman School, and Professor of Medicine at the College of Physicians and Surgeons. Dr. Freed is an internationally renowned leader in the fields of epidemiology and geriatrics. She has dedicated her career to the science of healthy aging, particularly the prevention of frailty, disability, and noncommunicable diseases, and design of approaches that will strengthen the benefits to all of being an aging society. The latter includes the design of health-promoting activities and roles for older adults that solve major societal needs. Dr. Freed co-founded Experience Corps a community-based senior volunteer program designed to support the academic success of children while also serving as a health promotion program for older adults. Dr. Freed's scientific career has defined the phenotype of frailty as a new clinical syndrome, provided evidence as to its causes, and identified opportunities for prevention. Her research has also identified approaches to prevent cardiovascular disease and the loss of independence with aging. Mr. Paul Hogan is the co-founder and chairman of Home Instead Senior Care, the world's leading in-home senior care company, and has dedicated his career to shifting negative perceptions that are associated with aging. Established in 1994, Home Instead identified and responded to an emerging worldwide need to provide affordable home care for the rapidly aging population. Home Instead's model of privately paid non-medical home care has established a new model of senior care and has become an integral component of the senior care continuum. Paul is also Vice Chairman of the World Economic Forum Global Agenda Council on Aging and was a contributing author to the Council's report, Global Population Aging, Peril or Promise. Paul is also co-author of Stages of Senior Care, published by McGraw-Hill. Now I'll turn it over to John. Wonderful, and greetings everybody from a relatively cool Geneva. It's a great pleasure to be able to join with you today and to talk about what is one of the most significant issues that's confronting society in the first half of the 21st century, and that's population aging. If you look at the agenda, you'll, you'll see that we're going to talk about it from the perspective of this Global Agenda Council, which all three of us work with as part of the World Economic Forum. We're going to take you through some of the work of the Council, which includes a book which was released last year at Davos. And then we're going to tell you a little bit about some activities that took place at Davos this year and then some other initiatives which are in train. I'll start by telling you a little bit about our Global Agenda Council on Aging. So the World Economic Forum has identified a number of key issues which it believes it's worth getting experts from around the world together to talk about and to try and identify some innovative strategies that may help guide the world to more effective responses. One of these is the issue of population aging. And in fact, if you look at the risk surveys currently undertaken by the World Economic Forum, you'll find that the issue of aging is being perceived increasingly as an issue that is one that needs to be dealt with urgently by governments and by the private sector. The Agenda Council, which has been brought together, includes people from the public sector, from NGOs, from academia, but also from private industry. And you'll see here that there's about 20 members. They come from all around the world, from Asia, the Middle East, Africa, as well as Europe and the Americas. Essentially, we come together each month on a teleconference. We communicate between that using electronic means. And then every year, we meet in either Dubai or Abu Dhabi because the Agenda Councils are supported by the United Arab Emirates. 
each council is now appointed for a two-year term. In the previous council, which we were all involved in, one of the key issues, one of the key strategies we decided would be worth following in order to progress discussions on ageing would be to come up with a book which identified some innovative strategies which were somewhat different than the way people normally think about ageing and the way we sometimes have knee-jerk reactions to it. Why would ageing be considered such a priority issue? Well, the fact is the world is ageing and it's not just the rich world. If we look globally over the past six decades, the number of people aged 60 and over grew just 2%, from 8% to 10%. But if we look forward to the middle of the century, we see that, in fact, from 10%, the global population of people aged over 60 is going to increase to 22%. So it's going to more than double. And if you read the newspaper or if you listen to the radio or watch television, you would often think that this was a major problem because the way this is often portrayed is this will put an unsustainable burden on health systems, an unsustainable burden on pension systems. And little of the benefits of this amazing transition are really discussed. But we actually feel that, in fact, the ageing of society is a very overlooked opportunity, that older people are a wonderful resource a resource to their families, to their community, and to society as a whole. But to really fully appreciate that resource and to benefit from it, we need to make sure that they can retain their health, and we also need to make sure that they can continue to participate in society. And so the book which we, which we brought out, which we'll discuss in a little while, tried to identify some of the ways we might be able to make that happen. If we go to the next slide, what you will see is this is a map of the world which shows the proportion of the population over age 60 in different countries. And while it doesn't come out very clearly on the slide, the only country at the moment where over 30% of the population are aged over 60 is Japan. You'll see that North America and Europe and Australia are also on the older side of world trends. But if we go to the next slide, what you'll see is how this map looks in the middle of this century. And here you'll see that it's a very large part of the world will be experiencing the same population demographics that Japan currently experiences. And one of the things that often surprises people is it's not just the rich world which is going to face this transition. You can see, for example, that China by 2040 will have a bigger proportion of older people in its population than the United States places like Vietnam and Thailand, Iran and Chile. These are places that people don't necessarily expect to be older, but by the middle of the century, they will be experiencing a similar demographic profile to what Japan has today. And the other thing that these countries are facing is that this transition is occurring much more quickly than it has in the past. So that while France, for example, had 20 years for the proportion of the population over the age of 60 to double, from 7 to 14%. These other countries like Thailand and Vietnam are going to have to accommodate that transition in 20 years. And so if there are challenges associated with population aging, they're going to be much more acute in these emerging economies. One of the things, though, that we tend to do when we approach this transition is we tend to apply thinking from the 20th century to these 21st century demographics. And so what, what do I mean by this? this? This is a slide which shows the way I expected to live my life and, and perhaps many of you. When I was born in the middle of the last century, I thought that I would study till I was 20, 25. I would work till I was 60, 65. Then I would retire and I'd be dead in my early 70s. Now, the general trends would encouraged me to feel that that's probably not going to be the case, and it's quite likely that I will live considerably longer. But when we think about those extra years, what you'll see is we tend to automatically just add them to the end of life. We may be living 15 years longer, but we think of that as, well, that's going to be 15 more years of retirement. But perhaps that's not the way we need to think about it. And in fact, in the US at the moment, 
it's only a small minority of people approaching traditional retirement age who actually want to retire, who want to follow the standard pattern from the past century. So what about if instead of adding those years at the end of life, we thought about adding it through life at different stages, spicing it all up a bit. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see what I mean. If perhaps instead of thinking we just limit education in our years to the, our early 20s, to thinking, well, we can go back to university in our 40s because we know we'll be living longer and we can have a, quite a significant career ahead of us even if we start at 45. Or we may want to opt out of society and have some time with our families or some time to, to ourselves and some of our passions at different stages in life. And so living longer doesn't necessarily have to follow that same stereotypic cycle that was developed for in, in the last century. And so that leads me to the work of our council and thinking about how we can create a society which will enable this radically different way of thinking about the life course. These are the things which we've been thinking about through the council or working on through the council to try and progress what we see as quite a revolutionary way of thinking. First of all, we this year in Davos, we had a session which all three of us participated in to discuss with the senior decision makers and academics who participate in Davos whether these ideas resonated with them. We also feel that it's very important as a council to try and make sure that when we talk about these things, it's not just talk, that there's actually an evidence base to it. And so we're trying to underpin the work we do with, with quality research. And as I said, we, we released this book in Davos last year on population ageing peril or promise. And I'll pass on to Linda to tell you a little bit more about that book. Well, good afternoon and greetings from New York City. I'm delighted to be able to join you and, and speak with you. So, as John just said, the Global Agenda Council on Aging for the World Economic Forum saw that it was really important to, to bring together some of the real cutting-edge thinking across the world on how we transition to an aging society and evaluate whether this is, as many people seem to be anticipating, a time of great, almost unmitigated peril for us as a society, or whether there's huge promise in actually having longer lives. I'll just say that anticipating longer lives was the huge goal over the last hundred years of public health, population health, of improved education and poverty. And we have accomplished an amazing amount to add these years to life. The balance, of course, needs to be really positive as well as perceived as positive. So as a council, we wanted to look at the issue of aging with an open mind, consider the challenges, but also identify the opportunities that may be there. And we conceived this book because we wanted to examine the impact of the changing global demographics and identify and develop best practices that could seize the social and economic opportunity created by the aging population. Our charge was to examine the impact of changing global demographics, as I just said, and see what the balance might be between peril and promise. The book, which was published late last year, is a compilation of 22 essays authored by 42 experts on aging. Authors include the people on this call today, as well as David Bloom from Harvard University, Colin Milner from the International Council on Active Aging, Emmanuel Jimenez from the World Bank, and a number of others. The book is available online, and we will include a link to that in a follow-up document. The book has four major sections. First, the backdrop, what we must contend with as we proceed into uncharted territory in human history of adding an extra 30 or even 40 years to human life expectancy. And then why we must act now. The first group of essays paints a picture of the social, economic, and political environment that will set the stage for policy decisions on aging. 
As we look around the world, we see anxious, unprepared societies that are being bombarded by the media with stories about the burdens of growing older, and we're aware that how we frame this issue drives the policy decisions that we make. And so the question is, is that the right direction? Section two is about investing in ourselves. The second group of essays looks at innovative ways both to see the social capital that an aging world and an aging society might offer in the form of older people themselves. Older adults in the world are only increasing natural resource. And if we focus on the capabilities, which are immense, and the opportunities to go beyond even what older workers currently can offer, to think about future roles for both workers and retirees and fruitful activities, this may create a huge avenue into opportunity that to this point has been untapped. There are a variety of approaches we might consider through flexible retirement policies, age-friendly cultures and working places, lifelong learning, or redesigned pension and health systems. The third section focuses on an essential component to success for an aging society, which is pursuing healthy aging and understanding what that involves. The third group of essays focuses on ways that we can arrive at old age healthier, both by investing in preventive care throughout life and modernizing medical and public health education so that we can set the stage for the right investments at every age and stage of life to create health. In addition, how we better manage advanced illness and chronic diseases or even delay the biological process of aging itself. While we know many people are living longer, evidence that they are also living healthier is somewhat thin and still preliminary. Creating health and aging is the major global goal for an aging world, one that unlocks the potential of longer lives. Widening and deepening this evidence base is a priority because if people can retain their health as they age, it's easier for them to remain socially connected and participate in the workforce and in contributing to their communities, which is something very important to people as they get older. In the coming decades, a significantly greater number of employees, especially those not doing manual labor, may be able to work productively into much later ages than they do today. And additionally, older adults bring unique social capital, whether in the paid workforce or not. And this is social capital that we need. Finally, the fourth section of the book is about redesigning our environment. What a better world might look like. So the final group of essays explores what an age-friendly world might look like, and it posits that if we design our environments, our cities, our capabilities to enhance the independence and engagement of older people, the designs themselves will turn out to be even better for people of all ages. This involves greater mobility, including transportation, but also labor mobility across borders, age-friendly cities, technologies like robots and other approaches that assist older adults to stay engaged, but also our environment of social institutions, such as social protection for older people and protection of human rights. The bottom line from this book, the take-home points in envisioning our future is across a group of categories, and I'll just summarize them. That we need to adapt business practices to accommodate older workers and maintain their presence in the workforce. Opportunities include raising the retirement age, modifying pension systems to encourage longer employment, eliminating incentives for early retirement but in ways that do not discriminate against people who are ill or have had limited opportunities for work that can be engaged in in older age. Modifying business practices, work schedules, and environments 
to accommodate older workers and facilitate their continued significant contributions, and to provide special training such as lifelong learning approaches for older workers. The second is to develop health and wellness programs which have the potential to delay early onset of health problems and thus maintain a healthy aging workforce and avoid unnecessary medical costs. There are significant opportunities that could come through investing in prevention and health preservation, promoting lifetime health and well-being through a variety of both wellness programs and environmental approaches to keeping people active and healthy. Third, accelerate the education of geriatric health professionals and other areas to support the emerging need. The opportunities and perhaps necessities are globally to increase the funding and support to educate geriatricians and public health professionals in the health improvement and health care for an aging population. And even in medical schools and public health schools to expose all health professionals to geriatric care and prevention, to ensure social protection policies that provide a floor of income, pensions, and health coverage for all people. Fifth, to advance work to mitigate age discrimination and afford protection of the rights of older people, and increase the focus on the rights of older people at national and international levels. Finally, the conclusion of the book is that time is absolutely of the essence. It is critical, particularly in the developing world, but even in the developed world, to anticipate the aging of the population and put in place the policies and new approaches in anticipation of need in order to optimize our outcomes. Okay, thank you, Linda, and I think that is back to me now. And what we thought was we would tell you a little bit about our experience at Davos this year. It's the first time I've been to Davos. I think Paul and Linda have both been before. And it is an amazing experience. You have senior people from all over the world, very senior decision makers. And one of the things I found most heartening was in many of the sessions I participated in, aging was spontaneously brought up as an issue. For example, people like Christine Lagarde and Ban Ki-moon mentioned it in their plenary presentations. And the other heartening thing was that when you would talk to people about aging, when I said I was the director of aging with WHO, people would actually really engage. And they were really looking for some better solutions than the response we've generally been applying to date, the sort of knee-jerk we need to make sure we don't go broke, so we need to cut pensions, increase pension age, and somehow reduce demand on health services. And so what we thought would be a good way of progressing the issue would be to have a session where we worked with some of these very senior people to try and think about the issue of how does a country know that it's well prepared for this transition we know is going to happen? Because that's one of the other amazing things about population aging. Unlike most of the other major things that are going to impact us over the next 50 years, this one's been entirely predictable. So we had a session. It was full to overflowing. We had to turn away about 20 people. It was very much a working session. And we had some very senior people leading groups of about 10 people, people such as the Deputy Prime Minister of Belgium, the Labour Minister of Germany, the Director General of the International Organization of Migration, the President of Standard & Poor's, the head of the Korean Pension Fund, and then some other people from, from our council. So we're talking very senior people were committed enough to participate in this exercise. And we gave each table a simple task. We wanted them to think of themselves as consultants and that they had been approached by an emerging economy. And we gave them the statistics, actually, of China. And we asked them, OK, we're the government, and we want you to tell us, how can we prepare for this demographic transition we know we're about to experience? And we split them into, into four topics. One was looking at informal participation. So that's, that's about 
how can older people continue to remain engaged in their community and continue to participate with their families to the level they would like to? Another was about formal participation, particularly in the workforce. Because as I mentioned before, people approaching traditional retirement ages these days are thinking, well, well, maybe I don't want to retire, but also maybe they don't want to continue working at the same level. They may want more flexibility. They may want to, to somehow to be able to combine a pension and work. And yet most societies put barriers in their way to prevent that happening. And above all, they need to retain their skills. And in many employment situations, people are actually denied training in labor life because people assume that they're going to retire. So we ask them to look at how countries might be able to prepare in terms of workforce and, the form and formal participation. We ask them to think about how can we ensure that older people have financial security? And how can we do that in a sustainable way? Are there things we can do which will ensure that older people themselves can build the resources that they can draw on? Or are there ways that the public purse can be used that, in a sustainable way to, to support older people? And finally, we looked at how we can ensure the health of older populations, because if an older person can retain their health, there's really not much they can't do. There's not much to distinguish a healthy older person from a healthy younger person, apart from the fact that they've got a lot more experience. And so each of the tables sat down and they looked at, at those issues. And, and a few of the points that, that came out, the next slide shows you about financial security. And one of the things that came out is that everybody agreed that at the moment, financial literacy amongst older people is very low. And one of the things we can do is to build financial literacy in early ages, in midlife, so that people can prepare and know how to manage their finances better. That older people or, or people in midlife and earlier are not still really not planning their retirement uh, or, or the finances for the aging that they're about to face in an effective way, and so they need better training on that. And also that Social protection, and that includes access to both pensions and to health care, is absolutely crucial for not only the well-being of older people, but also to reduce the load on their families. Because particularly in, in parts of the, of the world where long-term care is not available, it's the family that often has to bear the burden. And so it's actually an investment in the family to ensure the health and the financial security of, of, of older people. So, Paul, you might want to talk about some of the other things that we discussed. Thanks, John, and greetings, everybody. I have the good fortune of seeing aging grow over the years as a topic at the World Economic Forum in Davos. I was there five years ago, and it wasn't on the agenda at all, and it has sort of slowly creeped into the mainstream, and this year was a great example of that, having you know a prime place on a, a prime day and such a great turnout. And I thought the way you started the meeting, John, or the, the workshop there was great when you asked people to think about one question, and that question was, how old is old? How old do you feel old is? And you got a lot of blank stares, and then a few people threw out different things like, you know, well, when I feel old or when the government tells me I'm old, or only one person really threw out a specific age. And I think this just was a great way to start it. And I think what we saw in that workshop, in that session, was just basically a growing recognition, you know, for the value of older people. And I know that we see that in our own company as I bring a sort of a private sector sort of perspective to aging in the World Economic Forum and the Global Agenda Council and, you know, starting my own business, just helping seniors get what they want. My family helped my grandmother stay in her home till she was 100. She, you know, she died there. That's what she wanted. That's what our family wanted. And then we set out to do for others what my family did for my grandmother. My grandmother had 12 kids and 50 grandkids. So she had a lot of people to draw on. So we thought, what do other families do? Well knowing that the vast majority of people wanted their loved one to stay in their home, just as that individual desired. So, you know, recent Marist survey showed that we do value older people. And it was very prominently agreed you know, among Americans that people do believe older people are knowledgeable and experienced. Three-quarters of the people in the survey said that they do value their contributions. But the other thing is that most Americans in this particular study express that, yeah, people over 65 receive too little respect from younger people. So 
we really need to begin to change the lens by which we look at aging if we're going to leverage the, the social capital that exists with an older population. Their experience and judgment is incredibly valuable. And, you know, you can read the newspaper and you can see reports like, you know, I saw one the other day, you know, 48% of all people over 60 have two chronic conditions. Well, if we flip that lens, shouldn't the bigger story be that 52% don't? And how can they be a part of the solution? How can they be productive and participating in our society and our businesses and, and our economy? So to foster opportunities for older people to learn new skills, I was just talking before this session started with Liz, and she talked about how she's seen all the technology changes that affected media, just like this webinar, but along the way she was able to gain new skills to stay up with the technology and the changes and, and remain productive and so on. So this will increase the participation rate. I mean, we, we hear metrics like dependency ratio. You know, it used to be every six workers, there was one senior that's dependent on our safety net. Now we hear it's for every two workers, there's a senior. Why don't we start talking about what is the participation rate of our population? And then redesigning health systems to be more preventative and wellness-centric. These are all things that we believe as a council, you'll read it in Parallel and Promise, you heard it come up in this workshop that we were in as key components to adapting to an aging population. As the next slide states here, you know, to seize the opportunity to really, you know, harness what an aging population offers, we really have to create adaptations, talk about successful practices. I mean, there are several private sector businesses that have made adaptations like BMW and their production lines and like Vita Needle in Massachusetts, whose average age of employee is 74 like Home Instead Senior Care, we have 65,000 caregivers around the world, and a third of them are over 60. These are seniors caring for seniors to highlight these success stories so that we can begin to imagine what new government policies can be, how we can break down barriers for people to continue to participate in the workforce as volunteers as they pursue new skills and learning. So these are the things that were pretty prominently summarized in the workshop that we had in Davos and highlight great opportunities for adjusting. And then I think this sort of springboards us into this next idea that it will actually end activity that we have in progress here at the Global Agenda Council, and that is to engage the private sector. All of our activities are designed to create more age-friendly societies and private sector businesses for increased participation. And this initiative on the screen now talks about helping businesses become age-friendly. And we all know, well, it's pretty evident to us that the employee base of the future is going to look very different because when we're used to, as, as businesses, focusing on hiring people in their 20s and 30s to remain productive as organizations and competitive and profitable, I believe, we need to recognize the value of retaining older workers. And people, that's, and the nice thing is people want to continue to work if we can break down some of the barriers, such things that are rigid that won't allow businesses to cost-effectively offer flexible schedules. I mean, there can be some basic tweaks to labor law that allow businesses to accommodate what older workers would like, and that's flexibility and so on. And then we also recognize this is a big shift in the proportion of young to old. We are just simply going to have to harness what an older population offers in terms of the workforce. And we're putting the final touches on an age-friendly business. Uh, it's really called the Global Principles for Age-Friendly Businesses. And this is a, an effort to engage CEOs from around the world to start stimulating progress toward the implementation of business principles that help their businesses become more age-friendly, have more age-neutral policies, to help guide them into a state where they're more effectively retaining older workers. You know, the ultimate goal here is to basically elevate the idea of the age-friendly workplace to the same level as you see for say, race or gender in the workplace. 
So we're very excited about that. And we'll be introducing that in the spring here, and we'll be sure to let you know when it's out. So, Linda, I think we're back to you. So thank you. I'm going to wrap up this discussion by thinking at a high level about what is really the underlying question here or the overarching question of how can we turn this immense success of extending the length of our lives so significantly into really a victory for society and where are the opportunities to do that? And it's clear that certainly the social protection policies that the U.S. and other particularly developed countries have put in place over the last 50 to 100 years have been an essential floor, that they were put in place often at the right time, a time when there was a high proportion of young people in the population. For example, the U.S. implemented Social Security in the 1930s and Medicare in the 1960s. And because of high past fertility rates, there's been little need for rapid policy changes in the developed world. But this is going to change as certainly baby boomers retire and labor force growth slows and the cost of pension and health care systems rise, which we are already seeing dramatically in Europe, North America, and Japan. It is clear to the Global Agenda Council that government as the implementer of the things we must accomplish together with vision and leadership, government can be a catalyst to now move forward to create a society that supports aging and maximizes the value that seniors bring to the table and does so in a way that's good for all of us. And the question that we ask ourselves is how can we help government leaders identify best practices and benchmark their performance. To achieve this goal, we're in the process of creating an index that can serve as a guide to countries for a path that will accomplish creating supportive societies and when we actually haven't lived this before. And we need to have some vision of where we're trying to get and the steps to get there and be able to learn from the best practices across countries and around the world. So this index will help countries identify what's needed to become an age-friendly country and also help them identify policies that can move them further along the continuum to become more supportive of the aging population and importantly seize the opportunities and social capital that come with an older population. It's said that what gets measured gets done. And so having an index as a roadmap, if you will, for the world to understand what countries are getting it right and where the best practices are and when to implement them in the development of an aging society will provide essential information for countries around the world. While we're still working out the details for this, we will likely create this index with standard and pores. The index will likely measure the stages of an aging society at which different essential investments and institutions are needed to be able to permit optimizing for all of us the experience of longer lives. The specific investments and institutions that are beneficially created at each stage, for example, when do social protection policies like pensions and access to medical care need to be put in place? When do you need to, in the development of society to invest in prevention in middle and older age as well as young age? When is it essential to design our urban environments to optimize mobility? Ability, access, transportation, and health and community in an aging world? And when do we need to think about not just investing in healthy aging, but identifying and investing in new roles for older adults in an aging society that bring benefit to society? So, Paul, I'll turn this over to you or John to wrap up. Yeah, I think it might be me, Linda, and I think it would be best if we leave as much space as possible for questions. There's a few more slides, but I think it's better if we have some interaction. Okay, the first one goes out to John. Question is, longevity bonus is, a, is functional. It doesn't really begin at age 70. It begins really at a healthier age, like in the 50s. 
Who's addressing this reality and how? Okay, that's a good question. I mean, I think the idea of showing when, when we were in the session asking people when is someone old is exactly that. It's, it's the idea that it's not a chronological date. It's about maintaining function, and if you can maintain adequate function, you can really be as young as you want for as long as you want. Who's doing it well? There's a company, and unfortunately I've forgotten what it is, that in the U.S. offers people when they approach traditional retirement ages several options. They say you can retire, and here's your benefits package, or you may keep working as long as you want because we, we don't distinguish on the basis of age. But you may also choose what we call in the 1,000-hour work year. You can take those 1,000 hours any way you want. You can work a couple of days a week for the whole year, or you can work for a few months and then take the rest of the year off because they're big enough that they can afford that sort of flexibility. And I think it's that sort of innovative thinking that's really going to lead us to some solutions which actually provide that, the flexibility that everybody's looking for throughout life. And I think one of the other key things is the issue of maintaining your skills and maintaining your knowledge so that you can stay relevant. And there's so many exciting opportunities coming up with web-based learning these days. And there's studies now going on looking at how they, that can be designed in a way that regardless of your age, it is as easy as possible to, to maintain your skills. So I think there's a, there's a lot of examples, but they're just a couple. Great. And if you can think of the name of that company, I'm sure we'd be interested to know who's doing it right. Next question is for Linda. Can you define and give some examples of social capital? Social capital has to do with roles in society that people play that creates value. Many of the measures of social capital have to do with the productivity that results from work, paid work, as John was talking about. But in addition, as we create opportunities for older people to stay in the economy, we also, I think, can create new kinds of social institutions that afford older adults the opportunity to give back to society and really make a profound difference. And institutions that can organize the contributions of older adults to really make a profound difference will be turning their desires into real social capital. That could include roles of older adults, for example, volunteering as an experience corps in public schools in the U.S., in roles designed to really increase significantly the success of children in school. It could include many Roles for huge societal unmet needs, like improving our environment, that could make a really big difference in all of our well-being. Great. I also wanted to just mention to the attendees that the presentation, contact information, and supporting material will be online tomorrow behind the website wall at AHCJ, and you should be able to download it sometime within the next 24 hours. The Global Agenda Report is also available online, and a link will be posted to that as well. We have one other question, which is, what kind of financial documents, advisors, planners, and so forth are available for those of modest means, for example, the middle class or the working poor here in the U.S.? You mentioned that most people don't have a clue about financial planning. How do we help them? Well, I think one of the things we learned through the research we did to write our book, Stages of Senior Care, is that we learned that basically there's a wide chasm in knowledge for what are people's options today. You know, for example, back when I, in the early 90s, when I started Home Instead Senior Care, there was really only two options. It was either going to be your daughter's home or the nursing home. Well, today there's been a whole proliferation over 20 years of different options from you know, the senior center to the assisted living to the memory impaired to the independent living to everything through hospice. So there's so many choices. But what people don't know is what those options are, how much they cost, and who's to pay for them. So many people are living under the assumption, that the condition, the, they've been conditioned to think that government's going to be there for them to pay all their needs. Well, just the very awareness that they won't will stimulate a greater interest in planning, or it should, and we should facilitate that interest in learning about planning and preparing. We also knew that 
in our study is that most people underestimated the most expensive forms of care and they underestimated the most expensive forms of care, but they overestimated the least expensive forms of care. And when you have this lack of knowledge, this lack of awareness, poor decisions are made, not just by people with money, but also with people without money or with limited resources. And for that matter, so do, so do governments. So I think there's a, a lot of education that has to, to be accomplished for a society to truly adapt and better prepare for aging. Okay, and that actually leads me into the next question, which is that we seem to need a full cost accounting system to show how things like access to medical and dental care save money in the long run. Is there data available showing cost savings for each preventive intervention strategy or with workplace flexibility and assigning monetary value to social capital? We're actually doing some work at the moment, we were talking about it today, about how do you do an economic analysis of these issues because the trouble is they're so complex and it's not just, for an older person it's not often not just one disease, they often have several. But I think there's no doubt that there is a financial benefit in investment but quantifying it's very difficult. Linda, I don't know, have you got any, uh, any suggestions? Yeah. So at Columbia's Mailman School of Public Health, we have been thinking very deeply about the need for this and are in the process of organizing a unit which can actually do the kinds of analyses that you very appropriately said we need. Great. Any idea when that will be available? We're in the process of just developing it now, so it will be a little while. Okay. So what do you make of the recent study indicating that there's greater burden of chronic disease now among people in their 40s and 50s? As in increasing or greater than in older ages? Increasing. Yeah, I mean, I don't think any of us are surprised as we look at some of the lifestyle factors around us. But I actually think an even more important study is one that uh, was reported just in the last couple of days, which showed that even in older age, if you change your diet, and this study was looking at the Mediterranean diet and encouraging olive oil and, and fish and, and that sort of thing. You can reduce the risk of stroke by 30% um, or the risk of death, premature death, by 30%. So I think the key message is, yes, we might be seeing those trends, but it's never too late to do something about it. And right. building on that, I'm, I think it's very clear that Many of these diseases that are emerging are a result of our environments and, and lifestyles and that prevention really matters here, just as John is saying, at every age and stage of life, both practices that the individual engages in, but, but in some ways, at least as importantly, how we, in, through our government and our communities, create the conditions that facilitate people's health. And that actually leads into our next question, and we're just about at 3 o'clock. So, Linda, any specific examples of past societies coming up with good solutions to include for and care for their aging population? There are a million examples. Some of them are societal, but many of them are the roles that older adults have historically played in societies that truly matter. And these roles, and keeping people active and engaged, staying active and engaged, are actually a hugely important part of health and well-being as people get older. They haven't historically been organized by government, except for a few examples in the U.S., like foster, the Foster Grandparent Program. But we can learn from those as to how to organize at a much larger scale for many more older people. If I can just add to that, it's interesting that in Asia, one of the think recent developments in response to aging populations has been the development of what they call older people's self-help groups. And I was recently in Myanmar, in, in what used to be called Burma, in a remote part of the Irrawaddy Delta where there was no access to running water, no electricity, but this remote community had an older person self-help group. And it really showed how society can come together and how that human resource that's inherent in older people can actually be used to address these challenges. That's wonderful. Here's an interesting question. Media and marketing tell seniors that they should drive fast cars and buy unlivable second homes in Florida and take fancy cruises and have unlimited sex with that little blue pill and other 
you know, non-truths about what life should be when you're a senior. Do we need to re-educate the media on how to present an accurate portrait of the senior population? I think that that's absolutely correct that we need to do that. We also need to understand it. So we have some understanding of what the current cohort of baby boomers want, but not as much as we need. And we have a lot of fantasies, which perhaps the advertising that you're speaking to articulates, but we need to get real about what the goals and opportunities and needs are of real people in the world now who are getting older. Yeah, I liken it to what the media is doing with young girls. I mean, portraying them as, you know, only thin and wearing a size four or six is the only way you can be socially acceptable. When they're when, when you watch the Super Bowl and you see seniors laying on the hood of their car at Taco Bell with tattoos all over them, that's not an accurate, you know, it's an unrealistic portrayal of what's dignified and what's aspirational. You know, and so you can kind of sort of see that the ill effects of young, you know, of that kind of portrayal on young women and even middle-aged women, for that matter. I think it has the same impact on seniors. Okay. Hey, Paul, I was going to wait till I was sixty-five to get my tattoo. Um, <laughs> th- th- there's actually there's actually a really good chapter in the book Population Aging Peril of Promise, written by Colin Milner on on the media and and aging. And on the one hand, we have these unrealistic fantasies. On the other hand, many people are bogged down in 20th century models of what it was to be old so that when we were born, we see our grandparents and that's the model we hold with us until we're old and then we we relive it. And we're going through such a dramatic transition, what we need to do is reinvent that way of thinking. I think it's it's neither the fantasy nor the stereotype. It's actually about getting real and, you know, what that reality is. We don't know yet. It's it's evolving, but it's only going to be if we talk to the people who are experiencing it and, and, and listen to their perspectives rather than try and impose some external models on them that we're going to get anywhere. We also need to imagine a future that we want that goes beyond our fears of dying, of being ill, of decrepitude. So we need to imagine the things that would really be great for older people but great for society and begin to experiment with them and create them. Staying just in the realm of um, fantasy or fear is not going to get us to a positive world that's good for each age group. Okay. Here's a question for any or all of you, perhaps. How do we pay for all this? I think that we have a limited understanding of the opportunities, and the opportunities could bring huge benefits. And we need to grapple with that. Some of the opportunities are creating health systems and prevention and health care that actually could do much more with less and would better address the needs of an aging population and health and well-being in ways we're not doing right now with our current medical care system. And beyond that, if we really create the opportunities for older adults to be contributing to society, we will start to reap a lot of benefits that we're not imagining. So I think we can learn how to create a much better, if you will, benefit to cost balance in society than we're currently imagining. I agree with Linda. At the beginning of the 20th century, we didn't ask that question when life expectancy was 45, and now it's increased to 85. It wasn't necessarily a cost, but I think we'd see that as a, as a wonderful gain. Why do we think any different just because it's 85 today, and what will it be at the end of this century? But we need to adapt. We can't just keep imposing the same models and we need to come up with some strategies which are relevant to those changing populations. Yeah, I I think well said by both. I I think one strategy is really elevating the personal responsibility aspect of aging and and this life course and this dividend that we have now been gifted. I mean, financial literacy at a young age will have compounded impact 
in those younger people's later years. So, I mean, as far as how we're going to pay for it, we're the next 15 to 20 years, yeah, we're going to really struggle to pay for it. But it doesn't mean we should struggle for 30 and 40 years. We should be able to make the adaptations, combine those with like public-private initiatives, because it's not just the public sector's problem. It's private sectors and NGOs and everybody's problem. You know, working together to make the adaptations that elevate the idea of personal responsibilities and what do you do with the resources that you now have at your disposal. Excellent. This will be our last question. To what degree are the proposals taking into account the needs of adult children of aging parents for whom supportive social policies may not be adequate? Yeah, we see this every day in home instead senior care because our clients have primary family caregivers who are typically between the age of 45 and 60 and they're in the prime of their careers and they're making major sacrifices and in many ways it interrupts their productivity. They expend opportunity costs by you know, taking time off work, ending their careers early to meet the obligations they have to their, their parent. And so these are adaptations that private sector needs to make to accommodate the workforce who are living up to their obligations of care for their loved ones and to what extent the government can help, you know, sort of break down the barriers for businesses to make these accommodations. There just should not be barriers in that regard because that ultimately lowers the cost. Family care lowers the cost of care for government. It's also important to remember that major policies like Social Security and Medicare are family policies. They were put in place in the 1930s and the 1960s to support the quality of life and standard of living of working age people so that when their parents needed help, it would not compromise their ability to live the life that their work should be entitling them to. It is really essential to the well-being of of middle-aged people who are working, of people in their 60s who are taking care of their parents, that these social protection policies are in place. They were designed not just for the old, but for multiple generations as family policies. Okay. Well, I guess we'll have to leave it there, unfortunately, at least here in the U.S., let uh, Congress try to sort it out. That may take the next 15 or 30 years. We're not sure, but we can hope. And in the meantime, I'd like to thank all the panelists for their participation and thank the attendees for hanging in there. We had some excellent questions today, and again, the information will be available for download tomorrow on the Association's website. So thank you, everybody, and have a great day.